Hi, my name is Roy Rumbo. I'm an accounting professor at the University of North Texas. I teach uh, engineering and accounting management too. Uh, today's uh, lecture is about property plant equipment, and it is uh, for my accounting 3110 students at UNT, but uh, this is published uh, to YouTube, and so uh, hopefully it's available to, to others. Uh, I, I will give credit here to McGraw-Hill, uh, that's the publisher of the textbook and the materials I'm using today. It comes from the e Intermediate Accounting textbook, uh, the Thompson Nelson Spiceland books, uh, a great book, highly recommended. So with that, I'm gonna share my screen and we're gonna get started here. We're near, uh, for my students, we're near the end of uh, 3110, Intermediate Accounting 1. Uh, we basically go down the asset side of the balance sheet at UNT for Intermediate Accounting 1, and then and uh, Intermediate Accounting 2, we go down the liability side and, and hit some other uh, complex issues. So uh, I love uh, both of these courses. Uh, for those who don't know me, I was Chief Accounting Officer for two public companies, so have lived and breathed all these subjects. And so, but I'll try not to bore you uh, with too, uh, too many of my stories and try to teach the materials. So we're gonna be talking today about not just property plant equipment, but also uh, natural resources, as well as intangible assets. And so these are uh, property plant equipment um, and intangible assets and, uh, and natural resources. They're all long-term assets on the balance sheet. What does that mean? We're gonna use them for more than just a year. Remember, uh, those assets that we're going to turn into cash in the next year, be used in the next year, uh, those are considered current assets. So now we're talking about long-term assets. Obviously, uh, we're going to get into this, both this and this chapter and in the next chapter. If you're using it longer than a year, you're benefiting it over a multi-year period, multi-accounting periods. We're going to have to find a way to record the expense uh, for using these assets over a longer period of time, and that will be uh, depreciation expense, which you probably know from your introductory accounting classes. Uh, today's lecture is more about how do we record these assets upon acquisition. And so there are, as with all the intermediate accounting subjects, there are some unique nuances. So again, I think you know what property plant equipment would be. We've you know, dealt with that in, in previous courses, I'm sure. But here, you know, we're going to look at natural resources as well. Uh, I'm in uh, Texas, and so home of uh, the oil and gas industry pretty much. And so we have a lot of oil and gas deposits and companies that uh, uh, go out and get those oil and gas deposits out of the ground and sell them to you and me. And so that's a you know, very interesting and important subject here in Texas. But if you're up in Maine or some other areas of, of the United States, timber tracks, yeah, that would be interesting uh, how you uh, plant and then cultivate and then cut down timber to make paper products. And that's, uh, you know, very cool. I've been up to the Maine many times and just, uh, you know, they own, the paper companies own most of the state of Maine and all these timber tracks are natural resources for the uh, paper companies. And then mineral deposits, you know, gold, copper, uh, lithium now, uh, all of that uh, would be here. And then intangible the assets, we'll get through these, but you know, these are assets you cannot touch and feel patents, copyrights, trademark franchises, goodwill. And we'll talk about each of these today. So uh, the acquisition costs that we're going to, let's, let's just get one thing out of the word, out of the way here and as to define capitalization. When we say we're gonna capitalize a cost, that means we're going to record an asset. Contrast that to something we're gonna expense. So we spend money and if it gets expensed, it goes to the income statement. If uh, we spend money and it gets capitalized, it gets recorded as part of these assets. And so obviously most <laughs> operational managers with budgets, they want things to be capitalized. And so there's a lot of pressure on the accountant to capitalize as much as possible uh, so that it doesn't get expensed immediately in this current accounting uh, period. So we need rules around this that we have to follow with accounting in generally accepted accounting principles. And so here's a really good definition. It reminds me of what we uh, covered under inventory. It's all the expenditures uh, necessary to get the asset and condition and the location for its intended use. 
that sounds a lot like uh, purchase of inventory. So you have freight in and other costs there uh, around inventory. Same thing here. Now, after we start using the asset, all the future costs, maintenance, insurance, they're not capitalized. So these are costs that are incurred before the first date of utilization of that asset. And you can see uh, a lot of different kinds of costs. This is a really good slide here because there's a lot to unpack here. And I'm not going to bore you by going through every one of these, uh, but you know this is in um, your textbook. Whether you're using McGraw Hill or not, you can see this, and so that's important to know. Uh, land improvements, we'll talk uh, about that uh, by itself, but that's uh, after you buy land. There may be some other costs that that you incur around land, uh, buildings, the purchase price, commissions, reconditioning, everything, getting that ready uh, for its initial use. And then natural resources, we'll talk more about that later here in the chapter. Intangible assets. Uh, now, here's the one important uh, thing I want to note on this slide, because there's a lot of intangible assets we will develop ourselves as a company in our R&D shop, research and development. And the companies I work for uh, spent a lot of money on research and development. But in the hat to, you know, if you're not developing the new and the greatest uh, air conditioner, if you, when I worked at Linux or washer and dryer at Maytag, if you're not uh, researching and developing the newest and greatest, you're not going to be around for long. And I use it, Maytag as a great example. We uh, first introduced the uh, uh, front load washer to the American market. It was very common outside. And at first, people like that's crazy. But we did a lot of good internal R&D, develop a great washing machine that became called the Neptune that became very uh, widely used. Here's the point of this slide. R&D costs are never capitalized under generally accepted accounting, accounting principles. Let me repeat that. Our own internal R&D costs are expensed immediately by role. And I, you know, it's hard to, um, really get to some of the logic behind it, because I could have a counterpoint that these R&D costs are developing new product that's going to be a great win in the market. We should capitalize those because those costs could result in a long-term benefit for the corporation. So shouldn't we capitalize those? Well, part of the issue is that, yes, there's a lot of research and development, but a lot of it doesn't come to fruition. I know at Maytag, we would have loved, and we, I'm, we did research it, I'm sure, how we could have clothes come out of the, go right from the washing machine to the dryer and immediately folded, you know, and come out just beautiful, ready, ready just to put in your closet or whatever. <laughs> what a dream, because I hate folding clothes. I don't mind doing laundry, but I hate folding and ironing. Oh my God, hate that. And so, well, that never happened. And so a lot of the research around uh, developing products that would fold close uh, went nowhere. And so since a lot of R&D costs are, do not come to fruition, the uh, fast, you wouldn't know which ones to capitalize and which ones are not to capitalize in any accounting period, because you don't know which one of these are gonna end up being a win in the marketplace. You think about pharmaceutical companies developing drugs. A lot of drugs uh, make it through the first or second trial, but they don't get all the way to market. Something happens. They have a bad uh, test result out in the field and they, you know, maybe someone died and they have to just cancel that entire, um, uh, that entire drug and forget about it. And so all those R&D costs for those drugs, it, it's, it, it's gone. And so since you don't know in the accounting period which ones are gonna come to fruition, uh, the, the accounting rules require you to expense all R&D. So how, if we're developing um, you know, patents and whatever, and uh, you cannot capitalize internal R&D, how do you get to some of these things becoming assets? Then? Well, we may buy patents developed by other companies. We may defend patents that we have developed through R&D. In the defense of a patent, uh, the legal fees around that, we can expense those. Filing fees for patent, we can capitalize those. So there are a lot of costs that can be capitalized, especially the purchase price. Thing, same thing with copyrights. Um, we can, uh, the purchase price for copyrights, many companies 
Uh, if you think Netflix is buying a lot of movies, you know, they didn't develop, they are developing some movies, but mostly they're buying movies. And so that purchase price gets recorded as a copyright. Same thing um, with a lot of these, these other businesses. And then we'll talk about Goodwill as a whole separate subject around Goodwill that's different. Again, property, plant, and equipment, and tangible assets can be acquired many different ways. We can buy it, we can build it ourselves. Uh, business combination means we buy another company and inside that company, we're gonna pick up their intangible assets, property, plant, and equipment. Uh, now we can lease our factories and things and in accounting 3120 intermediate two, we're gonna talk about lease assets and lease obligations. That is kind of new. Or we can exchange one of our old uh, piece of equipment for a new, for someone else's piece of equipment. And so there could be exchange. So, a lot of different ways. And so we got to think about how do we account these for the all these different ways. So equipment, uh, I think this is pretty much common sense here. Obviously the purchase price, what you paid for it, any sales tax, that's directly rated to the equipment, any transportation costs to get it into your facility, expenditures for installation and testing, legal fees, do that. So, you know, sounds uh, pretty simple. I'll give you a great example. Uh, of uh, we, we were buying in Cleveland, Tennessee. I work for uh, the Maytag Corporation, but we own the large, um, uh, the largest, one of the largest uh, factories in the United States for developing cooking products, wall ovens and and countertops and freestanding ranges that you, you're very familiar with. And uh, all that metal had to be stamped. And we bought this really monster piece of equipment. I'm talking about, and it was. I can't remember, super expensive, but it was really, really heavy. And it helped us bend a lot of that metal, you know, faster, easier, quicker, cheaper. And so it was worth the cost. However, uh, if we just bought it in and put it into the factory floor, it would have crushed that concrete floor. It was that heavy. And so we had to dig out, uh, you, know, you know, one or two, I don't know, 30 feet down and fill it with specialized concrete underneath that machine in order that that machine could be put in our factory. Well, guess what? All the cost to dig that hole, put in the specialized concrete, that was capitalized, you know, debit to the equipment cost and then later depreciated. And so uh, that you think about this expenditure for insulation and testing uh, in some large factories, this could be a really big deal. And I believe that might have been three or four, five hundred thousand dollars that we're talking about. What I just mentioned, and I don't remember how much the machine cost, but it was in the millions. Now land gets interesting because uh, you know we, we have all these things, the real estate commissions, all the stuff that you would think, um, you know, here back to keep in mind if you had insurance on on the land, the insurance prior to purchase. Well, you know, I guess you wouldn't have any and after purchase would be different. Let's just go back to equipment. If you had some, you bought insurance in the date of purchase, and then let's say for three months you didn't use the equipment, you know, it was a one-year insurance poly, those three months of insurance, getting it ready to be used and, and protecting it while you're transporting it in, that insurance uh, could be capitalized. But after you start using the equipment, the insurance is not capitalized, it's expense. Uh, or property taxes around any of these things. You gotta think about this, you know, before uh, it's ready to uh, be used. Now, uh, for land, uh, you know, okay, here's another uh, thing here that could be complicated. If there are some back taxes on the land, so maybe we're buying it from someone who had not paid all their taxes. Well, that'd be the, that would not be part of our ongoing cost. That is a past cost. We had to pay those in order to buy the building. Uh, the, the buy the land. However, from after we purchase going forward, all those property taxes would uh, be expensed, you know, after we own the land. And here's an area that gets a little complicated because we have to divide between what we call land, which we're recording here, and land improvements is one of the next uh, slide or two. Um, so getting the land ready, clearing it, filling it if it had some bad spots, draining it, improving the drainage, um, and even, you know, just removing old buildings that just are in the way of what we want to use the land for. All that uh, could be capitalized. However, 
things, uh, land, and by the way, why do we care? Let's just stop here for a second. Why do we care? Why do operational managers, they want a lot of stuff to be included in land costs. And the reason is that land, after we debit land and credit cash or whatever, and debit credit for all these costs, and all the debits in here to this land asset, they do not get depreciated in the future. Land uh, is considered a permanent asset and we, we never record any depreciation expense on it. Just sits on our books and what we pay for it until we sell it. And so uh, that's why this matters. All these expenditures that get capitalized into our land asset, well, that's, that's good news, you know, <laughs> for the future because there's no expense associated with it. However, land improvements they do get depreciated in the future. So what are the kind of things um, that, that we might think about? Parking lots that we put on top of that land. That's not land anymore. That's a land improvement, driveways, a private road maybe to get there, a fence around the property to protect it, sprinkler systems for if we have grass growing there, whatever. All this are costs that's not part of land. Might seem like it because it's connected to the land, it's you know, parking lots. You no, know, you look at it, you think, hey, that's land, it's right there, you know. But if we spend money to develop or maintain a parking lot, that is part of a land improvement. And you know, these things are separately identified, separately capitalized, and guess what? They get depreciated based on what we think their useful life is. So this is a big distinction from but distinction between the previous slide. In this slide that we definitely have to think about. All right, moving on. Buildings. And I think these are the same things like you would think about purchase price, builders, commissions. And here's another area that could get fuzzy, refurbishing, remodeling, or doing things so that we will be able to use the building. Those can be capitalized as well. And so that's those are the kind of costs that, that get complicated. All right, natural resources, we're in Texas now. And so we have to think about this thing a lot because especially the oil and gas industry. So if we purchase it, uh, it will be the purchase price, but any cost. So like everything else we just talked about. If developed, uh, we could have acquisition costs, exploration costs. And we're gonna, at the very end of this chapter, we're gonna talk about uh, the successful efforts method or the full cost of those two methods of how you might record uh, exploration costs. And it's pretty interesting. I've never been in the oil and gas industry, so I'm kind of learning along here with you, but it's pretty interesting. Um, restoration costs. That's at the end of the life. Where we have to get the land back in condition. I guess it's a little bit of a spoiler alert. We're gonna have to record an asset retirement obligation, a liability along with this purchase for what we think uh, the, the future cost might be. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> it was the very next slide. That's crazy. Uh, yes, so we had to record an asset retirement obligation. And so this is, you know, it's obligations uh, at the end, after we've used equipment uh, to get that land back into its original state. And you do see this a lot with oil and gas companies. There may be um, uh, a contract or a legal environmental requirement to restore the land to its original condition. And that's gonna cost money. And so we have to estimate that when we purchase the land and it's another, it's a, an increase, it will be a credit, a debit to an asset and a credit to a liability with this. And so it's kind of interesting. And so we gotta think about scope, uh, recognizing this asset, how do we measure it? And we're gonna use the time value money which uh, you may or may not be familiar with, but you know you should become familiar with it. So here's an example, Jackson Mining Company. They paid a million dollars uh, for the right to explore coal on, coal, coal on 500 acres of land. Um, cost of exploring for the coal deposit, total 800,000, and they had some digging and erecting 500,000, um, and they purchased some new um, excavation equipment for 600,000. And after all the coal is removed, the equipment's gonna be sold, and now they got to restore the land to its suitable condition. Now, this is only in three years. 
Imagine if it was 20 years or 30 years from now. Hard to estimate. And so here, even three years from now, they look at three possible um, outcomes. It could either cost 500, 600, or $700,000. And they've, um, they've done some risk assessments at 30, 50, or 20% probabilities. And so they could just use an expected value calculation here. Um, and they can get to uh, 500,000. I hope that you're familiar with expected value calculations. You just take each uh, outcome and you multiply it times the probabilities. Note that these will equal 100%. And, and then you, you extend those out, you multiply them out, and you add them up. And so we said, hey, uh, there's three scenarios, five, 600, and 700,000, but the expected value of those is 590,000. Well, that's in uh, you know, nominal terms, but we're not gonna spend it for three years. And so we can take what's called the present value of that in today's money, and that would be uh, 468,000. And so this is the present value of 590,000, you know, present value of one, three years at 8%, you know, we, that, we, that was our interest rate for this uh, problem. And so it became, you know, 468. Don't want to go into time, you know, time value money concept too much here, and hopefully you're all familiar with it. But at, at an 8% interest, uh, if I was going to be 468,000 today or $590,000 in three years from now, I'm, I'm totally neutral on that. Those are equal uh, amounts in the time value money. So money that I have today is more valuable than money in the future. So 590,000 at 8% interest would be worth 468 today. And that's, we take into account that time value money and we record 468. What does it look like? Um, you know, we pay $2.3 million uh, for this uh, um, uh, in cash for this coal mine. But we're gonna add back now that liability of 468. And then, so now that really the cost of that coal mine uh, is 2,768. What does that include? That includes all the costs we incurred, 2.3 million for all these three things that were in the problem, and plus the asset retirement obligation. So this is a, a little bit, maybe a difficult concept. I understand it. I know when this was first passed, um, it was a bit of a hardship for me because now I got to, as a, uh, controller is my account at, you know, and I want to get into it. I'm going to have to record interest expense on that 468 to get it to the 590 in the future. So I uh, won't go into that, but, you know, it's uh, not uh, fun. It's, it, there's more work than you just see in this problem. But what you need to know for this chapter is hey, that is part of the acquisition cost. What I got to pay in the future, and that is, that does reflect faithful representation, remember chapter one, of the economics of this transaction, because uh, the company is going to incur that cost in the future, let's include it as a, a part of the asset cost now, and then that piece of the asset cost will get depreciated. So depreciation expense will be slightly higher. Now, when we pay the 590 uh, three years from now, if that estimate was right, then there won't be any expense at that time. You know, we'll have expenses along the way. Intangible assets. Okay, right here, second bullet. Can't touch and feel them. They lack physical substance, but man, are they valuable. <laughs> really, really valuable. If you can think about, uh, if you looked at, um, and I use Netflix as an example a lot, or if it was Paramount Plus or a lot of these streaming services, uh, the big asset they have is the intangible asset, the copyrights to be able to uh, show movies. Think about Apple Music that's paid for the copyright. So all that music out there that, they, that you can listen to every day or Sirius, if you like Sirius Radio or Spotify, their, their big asset is intangible assets. Can't touch and feel it, but they would not have a company if they <laughs> were not able to purchase those uh, intangible assets. And so now uh, there's two types of intangible assets, some that have finite useful lives and you know, some that hit indefinite useful lives, you know, meaning, you know, nearly permanent, indefinite. 
I, I can't put a time on it. Uh, a good example, uh, usually, generally, brands are indefinite useful lives. The Apple brand is an intangible asset that they will defend uh, to the end. A trademark is the apple with a little bite out of it that you see uh, around all Apple products. Uh, that's an indefinite useful life. There's no term on that. Now, you know, a lot of that was, you know, there are probably, uh, there's probably some dollars around the asset there, but uh, advertising costs also gets expense. So, you know, uh, like R&D and therefore there's probably, you know, a lot of value there around that. So here's some, a good example of definite live intangible. So a patent, is uh, good for 20 years. And so you see a lot of drug manufacturers, uh, they, they can control that drug for 20 years and make a lot of money off of it. And maybe they buy patents from other companies to go sell uh, some of the drugs because companies can buy the patents from other companies. Then they have the exclusive right to use that for 20 years. But after 20 years, that's over. Anybody can take that. Anybody can use that technology. So it's uh, a very finite life. Not indefinite life, it's a finite life of 20 years. Copyrights have a life of uh, 70 years. And um, you know this is an uh, exclusive right of a published work, song like Apple Music, film, Netflix, book, you know. So uh, uh, these are copyrights. And then trademarks, a slogan, a word, a symbol like the Apple symbol. You know, that's a really powerful symbol. It's probably worth, you know, I don't know, a lot of money. And so those, those are registered and, you know, for a period of 10 years. But a lot of times I think trademarks uh, could go be indefinite. It might be hard to steal that uh, trademark from somebody. And then franchises, you know, uh, this is, you think Subway, you know, the Subway store you walk into is not owned by the Subway Corporation. It's, it's, it's run and managed and owned by the person who owns the Subway franchise for that particular territory. And that usually will uh, be over for a specific period of time. They gotta meet all kinds of rules from the Subway Corporation and they pay for that uh, franchise up front. And then along the way, maybe as a percent of sales for their, their restaurants and that's a franchise. Again, man, these things can touch and feel them, uh, but they have a significant, significant value and you see a lot of artists selling their music. I forgot who uh, just the last few weeks sold their music, all the rights to their music for millions of dollars. The Beatles uh, did not own the rights to their music. That's a really good example. Michael Jackson, before he passed away, he owned all the rights to all the Beatles music. And Paul McCartney, he really wanted this back because he wanted to be able to, you know, he couldn't use his own music that he developed because Michael Jackson owned the copyright. And I believe that recently uh, Paul McCartney has bought that back. I think it was worth uh, five or six hundred million dollars, by the way, or probably more. I don't know. And that's uh, this crazy stuff. All right, here's an, another intangible asset. Even you can even less can you touch and feel this. It only comes about just so you know. Right now, right up front, we'll get into this, but. I want you to think about goodwill. Only the only time we ever record a dollar amount for goodwill is when we acquire another business. That's the only way it arises. I would say it always exists for things that we cannot record. You know, our client, our trained employees, our management team. Uh, a lot of goodwill emerges from these things. Favorable business location. You really can't value these things, but yet they have a value. And especially when one company buys another company, uh, they will pay a lot more. The acquisition price would generally almost always be worth a lot more than the fair value of every asset acquired. And that means every asset, even intangible assets, get valued like a brand gets value. And then um, the amount that, they, that one company pays in excess for another company over the fair value of those assets gets recorded as goodwill. And so again, goodwill only happens when one company buys another company. Uh, there will, I'm sure if, uh, you know, I've dealt with uh, acquisitions uh, throughout my career 
And, uh, you know, you will, if you're in my class, you will be tested on this because it is important to know. Because there's so much uh, in terms of strategy and industry consolidations and everything. There are a lot of companies buying other companies. And so you may be in that situation as a CPA where you're going to really have to know how to do this accounting. So here's an example. Smith's son uh, bought all the common stock of Ryder Corporation for $180 million. They own 100%. And then Smithson assumed all the long-term liabilities and, and purchased all their assets. And so what happens in, you know, in this acquisition accounting, you have to bring in appraisal experts and these guys, they know what they're doing. They're gonna come in and value every, every asset, every piece of equipment, every uh, computer software, everything the company owns. They're gonna go through a whole asset list and, and an intangible asset list and even intangibles, the company may not even have recorded around its brand, it's going to calculate a fair value of each of these and issue a report on the fair value of these, which will go to the Smithson Corporation, probably their controller. And he's going to have to calculate what is goodwill. In this case, uh, the fair value paid was $180 million. Uh, the fair value of all the assets were acquired, and that's just adding these things up here, was $250. Um, however, you got to subtract the liabilities because they, they assume that liability became their liability and uh, minus 120. And so every detailed asset value equals 130 million, but they paid 180. Did they overpay? Well, I can't answer that, you know, but they certainly paid a market price for that. If they had to pay 180 million, another company would probably have done that. So there may be some other things around this company uh, maybe their R&D team, maybe they have some management expertise that nobody else has, and they're going to do everything they can to maintain those employees. Maybe it's the location they're in. Uh, they, uh, you know, uh, so they paid 50 million more than the fair value of all those uh, net, uh, net assets, uh, net assets and liabilities. And so that's goodwill. And so when we uh, do the accounting, Smithson does the accounting for this, uh, they're going to record that liability. Where's it going to go? It's going to go in their books. And all these assets here, they're going to go in the Smithson books and record as assets, uh, not at the book value that writer had, but at the fair value that they calculated at acquisition date. And so this is going to be kind of a start over, if you will, for each of these assets. This property plant equipment, um, you know, may have been on the books at 40 million but they've recorded at 90 million. That's the fair market value. That's what they paid for in acquisition day. And they will start depreciating it from here. And so all of these assets go on the books and they have one more asset, uh, the 50 million in excess that they paid and that will go in as goodwill. Goodwill is not depreciated just to start here. When we get in the next chapter, we're gonna talk about how we handle goodwill, how we think about goodwill how it might be expensed in the future. So we're gonna to have to uh, do some testing around goodwill every accounting period, and we're gonna be testing uh, for impairment. And if that goodwill value declines over time, we will have to take an impairment charge. So it's not depreciated. And as long as that goodwill main maintains its value out there, it will not ever be expensive. Next. Lump sum purchases. So many times, uh, and I like the example down here below, we'll have one price, but we'll buy a, a multiple assets like that. Here's a 10 trucks for 150,000. Here's the, the bigger one that you'll always see on, on my exams for sure, but it's a real world example. Um, if you buy a factory, guess what? It's sitting on a land that should not be depreciated. But you know, when you buy a factory, you don't say, hey, I wanna buy the factory uh, for this price and I wanna buy the land underneath the factory for that price and I wanna buy um, the equipment. Well, how do you buy a factory if you don't buy the land? You know, I guess you, you could lease it. There's probably some exotic transactions you do, but usually you just sell it, all, when you're selling, you sell it all at one price, factory, the building, the land, the equipment, all at one price and the buyer pays, you know, is happy to just pay at one price. But in accounting, we know that land is handled differently and is not depreciated. So we're going to have to separate that, what we call lump sum purchase into the various assets. And guess what? A building 
most likely is going to appreciate and have a useful life that could be 30 or 40 years, a lot longer than the equipment. Uh, and so that may be five years of equipment. So we're going to have to separate these out and record them. How do we do that? We look at their, we look at their fair values. Now, so it's, you know, it's like, <laughs> like, it's like goodwill in this, this case. You got to go buy, you got to go pay an appraisal company. And if you're, uh, you know, if you like this stuff, uh, there's a lot of really good jobs for um, people who do independent appraisals of this. And they're brought in in this kind of circumstance. And you want it to be objective. You want it to be a separate person. It'd be hard for accountants to kind of appraise this stuff. We're not valuation experts. So you get someone to do it. And so in this case, look at all the fair values of each of these individually. If that building wasn't there, how much would the land be worth? And so everything has been fair, fair value. And the fair value in total is 2.2 million. Did we pay 2.2 million? No, we only paid 2 million. So we cannot debit assets for 2.2 million. We debit assets, you know, historical costs for what we paid for. This is not a business acquisition like Goodwill. So, you know, don't confuse the two. This is an asset purchase, a lump sum asset purchase. So what we're gonna have to do is allocate that 2 million and the relative fair values uh, for these assets. And so we just take 330 divided by the 2.2 million. Well, that's worth 15% of the price. 550 divided by 2.2 million, 25% of the price. So therefore we know that we come up with an allocation percentage based on that purchase price. And I think, you know, the answer, we're gonna take the 2 million we paid and now allocate it based on those uh, relative fair market values, 15, 25, 30, 10, and 20. And these are the asset prices that we will use uh, on our books. And so we will debit each of these in credit cash for 2 million in separate accounts. And so really important, land does not get appreciated, building all these uh, will get appreciated or amortized or sold. Sometimes we don't pay cash. We buy things in a non-cash uh, you know, manner. And so we'll go into each of these, deferred payments, uh, issuance of equity series, I'm gonna skip donated assets, uh, and exchange of assets. Uh, this is very common. We may buy an asset and we may uh, give the seller a note payable, you know, pay, pay you in the future, and it's gonna have some interest associated with that. If we uh, give someone equity, usually this is in smaller corporations, if you give me that land over there, I'll give you a 10% ownership in the company. Because maybe we don't have cash, we're a new company, we're a small company, but we want that land. You know, <laughs> We're willing to give up some ownership interest in the company. And uh, we just looked at the fair value of that ownership percentage, and we credit common stock for that to give them, represent the new ownership possession, and we debit land. What do we debit land for? The fair value of that stock that we've given up. So we'll have to um, you know, try to determine uh, you know, what the fair value of stock. If, if you cannot determine the fair value of stock, maybe it's a small company, go find the fair value of the land. And that might help value the fair market, fair market value of the stock that you've given. So which is ever is easier, uh, which has the best measure of fair value, you would do that. If it's land, I could come up with a really strong and clear objective fair value, I'll go value the land and then credit common stock for that value. So there are also ratios. We've done inventory turnover ratio, uh, receivable turnover. Well, guess what? Uh, average fixed asset turnover, and that is just net sales divided by average fixed assets. So that would just kind of tell us um, how efficiently we're using our assets. And so we're meaning if this is a high percent high number, then we're generating a lot of sales. If that's a 10 times, if our net sales are 10 times higher than our average fixed assets, those fixed assets are giving us, you know, 10, 10 to one, you know, that would be, by the way, super high. I don't think you would find them uh, that high. Um, and here's gap versus raw stores uh, from 2018. I'm sure these are probably real numbers. Gap, they were generating, uh, their fixed asset turnover was 5.85 the Ross was six. So they're generating more cells. Ross stores generating more cells off their gap. That could tell us 
you know, good volume in these stores, or maybe Gap is um, is overpaying for some of their stores. I don't know. There's, you know, I'd want to know more. Uh, but this is, gives you, whenever you get a numbers like that, you know, um, like ratios, now you can compare uh, your company to another company or to the industry. And that may tell you something that you may want to do differently as far as strategy is concerned. And we can exchange an asset for another asset. And it's important that, um, that we're going to come up with a fair value of these and then there could be some cash, old asset plus cash for a new asset. The key deal here, as you would imagine, we're gonna go try to calculate the fair value of the new asset and the old asset and, uh, and, uh, and determine that we may have, uh, in, in that case, a gain or loss in this. And so here was, uh, it, this one turned out to be, uh, you know, we paid 430, uh, we gave up $100,000 net book value, 500 minus the 400, and we got a $530,000 asset. So we have to take that off the books. Next scenario, we may go construct our own asset. We may build our own factory. Why buy, why buy an old factory uh, that doesn't really work for us? Let's go find some land, maybe in a cheaper uh, state or, you know, or country, and you know, maybe there's more available labor, uh, maybe not, you know, a union. I don't, I'm not going to say I'm pro or anti-union, but uh, companies try to, you know, um, build their new factories in um, other locations that might be cheaper for transportation of their products or for labor force or, you know, maybe tax benefits, maybe local governments will give them some benefits uh, to come to their, their place. So there's two kind of new issues that you haven't dealt with before you got to think about. When you're building your own asset, you may have some of your own overhead costs related to building that. And then you got to decide, uh, can I expense that or to get to capitalize that? So there's, there's an issue one there. Issue number two, I, if I didn't buy this asset, I wouldn't have incurred interest cost. And so this is interesting. You may be able to capitalize that interest cost. Instead of, so again, instead of debiting interest expense, I debit building. You know, so for operational managers, again, they like to capitalize things. So if your company that you're an accountant for is building a building and they're not capitalizing, capitalizing interest, there you go. You can be a hero. You know, you go in and say, why aren't we capitalizing interest? And you can start, start doing that. So uh, let's do the first one, the overhead allocation. And so uh, you got to make sure that you're only allocating incremental overhead costs. Just your normal ongoing overhead costs, you're not uh, allowed to capitalize. And so you got to look at all your overhead and say, hey, what, what has changed? What? Why do we have, uh, because of this building, we have incurred more overheads. So you gotta, you know, to me, directly uh, relate that uh, to the building, that incremental cost of overhead. Now, interest capitalization is a little easier and more clear cut. So definitely, um, you know, I'm gonna have multiple choice questions around interest capitalization. And so, uh, so when and how do we do it? Uh, that can be a challenge. And so, uh, number one, what assets qualify uh, to be, to allow us to capitalize interest? And so it has to be assets that are constructed that we're constructing for our own use. You know, we may use a contract manufacturer, but it's, it's something we're paying for the construction of that asset. Um, you know, and I guess if it's a discrete, you know, we're going to sell or lease that, that's okay. But let's just think about what we're constructing for our own use. And then if we're not incurring any interest, okay, <laughs> we can't capitalize interest that we're not incurring. So only interest that incurred during the construction period is eligible for capitalization. By the way, in this one, you do not have to, um, you do not have to directly tie that interest to the building. 
as long as a business is incurring interest during that construction period, that interest can be capitalized. Okay, how about timing? You know, accounting, I'd say, is all about timing. What's the period of time, starting point and ending point for capitalizing that interest? You cannot begin when you announce the new construction, you begin the first day uh, and the first ex when the first expenditure is made uh, for that construction. And then the, the last day is obviously when that building is ready uh, uh, to be used. And you can look at uh, average expenditures, but we'll look at some problems here, which I think are really good. So here is uh, the Mills Combined Equipment Company. Uh, they're building a new office headquarters and it's gonna be completed on June 30th, 2022. Uh, and the expenditure started on January 1, so that's the starting point. And so they started, we spent 500,000 on January 1, 400,000 on March 31st, 600,000 there. So we spent um, a million five in 2021, and these are actual dollars, not no interest capitalized. And then we spent 600,000 in the next year, 300,000 um, in 2022, and then we're done. Uh, so in total, we spent that'd be $2.4 million. Now, the company obtained a $1 million construction loan and an 8% interest. So there's the interest that we can capitalize. Now, they spent more uh, than a million, but if that's our only debt, uh, then that's, we can, we can only uh, capitalize the interest that we actually incur. Uh, and the loan was outstanding during the entire construction period. That's so good. Um, and the, they also had two other long-term notes of two million and four million, six and eight percent, and those were both outstanding during the uh, period. So these uh, come into play as well, and we are allowed to uh, do those as well. Okay, um, so if we just want to use the uh, the weighted average here, we could say the um, take the total month spend a million five divided by two seven fifty. Uh, that's one way of trying to find out what's the dollar amount that we could capitalize. The, the better way is to do a weighted average. So this 500,000 was outstanding for all 12 months. So I can do 12 months of interest on that 500,000. This was only outstanding for, you know, nine months, March 1. So, you know, from April through December. So I could only uh, take nine twelfths of that or 300,000. And finally, here, this was only outstanding for a quarter, October, November, December. So I'll only take one fourth of that 150,000. So our average accumulated expenditures were 950, not the million five. And so this is a weighted average. And it makes sense, right? This 500,000 was outstanding for the whole year. I could do interest on that. This 400,000, it wasn't outstanding the whole year, only nine months. And so we only take nine twelfths of it. And this 600,000 only outstanding for three months. So it, 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 it correlates uh, right with the, uh, the interest. And so uh, interest capitalized uh, could be 950 uh, times the 8% or 76,000. Now, um, we use the 8% because that was directly related, but we could bring in these others into play if necessary. In this case, we'll see that um, we don't need to because the 76,000 is covered by that entire 8% that direct cost. So cost of building a million five, 8% and that from the 950 that we calculated here, 76,000. So we one way of saying this is, man, we could have paid off our debt. We spent on a weighted average basis, 950,000. If we hadn't have spent that, we wouldn't have had to, but we could have paid off the debt instead, and we would have saved 76,000. Therefore, look at this interest as being incremental interest because we spent on a weighted average basis 950. So this is truly reflective of the cost of the building, that 76,000. We were allowed to debit the building uh, for the 76,000 and our building is a million five seventy six now. It's really a kind of a construction in progress. Um, we could go look at all the interest we incurred, 
this million times 8%. Remember, there was two other notes and the total interest we incurred was 680, uh, but we only can use the 76,000, you know? So, um, you know, so again, we would have been allowed to bring these notes in, uh, the, the new notes. Again, we do the same thing for 2022 and, uh, and, and, and look at that. Here's Walmart, you know, they're building stores all the time, all over the, all over the world. And, you know, and they, they capitalize interest on these construction projects. In fact, uh, big amounts, 36 million, 39 million, and 59 million in 2017, 2016, and 2015. They must've been building a lot more stores in 2015, or maybe there were higher interest rates. So companies are um, capitalizing interest. And you know uh, you should capitalize interest, and you're going to want to because it's uh, otherwise that interest will be expensed into the income statement and reduce your net income. You know again, operational managers want to capitalize things. So I've already broached this subject around research and development. Uh, again, the issue here, and this describes you know research and then development. You know uh, types of costs that we're talking about here, uh, and this includes salaries and wages of the people in the R&D department, any materials consumed in testing equipment. You know, at Linux, we had this monster <laughs> uh, area where we could simulate very cold climates or very hot climates. And so we put our air conditioning units in there to see how, th how they did in very cold or very hot climates. At Maytag, we had things that would put a washing machine through a, a 10 or 20 year cycle in like a month, you know, just have that thing running continuously. And now all those materials consumed in either of those facilities, they, we call those R&D costs. They're not capitalized, they are expensed. And um, even if we contracted someone else to help us out, service for them, that gets, uh, um, that gets expensed. Now, the only caveat here where you might be able to capitalize uh, some R&D costs is if you buy an asset and it's used uh, for more than just one R&D project. And so that would be, you know, maybe that really big room, that climate controlled room, I'm sure that's used for multiple R&D projects and that could be capitalized and then depreciated expense and uh, be recorded in R&D. But if you buy an asset just for one R&D project, no, no depreciation, uh, that whole cost just goes into expense. And so this is a, just something you just got to know if you're going to be an accountant. R&D gets expensed. And here's uh, some examples of uh, R&D costs. Now, here's like a timeline here. There are some costs that would not be considered uh, R&D, and that would be after you start producing. So up until the start of commercial production, all of these costs uh, that we've talked about are going to prototypes and everything else, testing, uh, laboratory research, all of that gets expensed as R&D. Then after commercial, then we'll look at each of these kind of costs that might be treated differently. And they would be non-R&D. And some of these might be able to be uh, capitalized. And so, uh, you know, so some of these costs after technological, oh, this is a uh, computer software, sorry. For computer software, uh, this is kind of an interesting because it's almost like R&D. We're trying different, we're developing software ourselves. We're trying different examples. Uh, most uh, of the, uh, the costs for computer software do get expensed like R&D until you reach technological feasibility. And that cost between there and the data product release could be uh, capitalized. In my experience, this is not equal. This is a really small dollar, and these were big dollars. And so there's some really, if you get into um, computer software development, then uh, there's a lot of very specific rules there that uh, I feel like a little bit beyond the scope of this course that I'm not going to talk about. And maybe it's also less important these days because companies are not developing, more companies are not developing their own computer software. They're using the cloud. And so they're using uh, software uh, developed by others, if you will, 
and the software sits out on the cloud. A lot of people even storing their most important data uh, out on the cloud. And um, this is a really big business for Amazon, for Microsoft. I think IBM is trying to get into that where uh, they will let you put your data, even super confidential data on their site and they will protect it. And so, uh, and, and allow uh, people to, uh, you know, access that data or make orders, you know, so sometimes when you're ordering online uh, from company A, it might be going through Amazon's or Microsoft's uh, back office, not the company's. And so uh, that, that's something just to know. So we've got to think about that uh, differently. Um, and so uh, we could capitalize a, a cloud computing arrangement if we have the contractual right to take possession of that software. So we're gonna let you put it on your cloud, but you know, if we'd said we want off the cloud, that's our software, we're just bringing it back on our own servers. You know, that's, I, in my company, it's more rare, like we just use their software, uh, you know? And so, uh, it, and if we had a contractual right to take it, we also have to be able to run that software on machines. You know, if it's some big mainframe, really large computer, we couldn't even run it regardless, then uh, you're not able to capitalize if you cannot capitalize, you treat it as a service contract and you expense it as incurred, which is just think generally, this is how cloud computing costs are recorded. Now, if you're performing R&D for other companies, uh, you may be able to capitalize those costs as inventory. And then when you turn over the, the product or whatever you're researching to the company, then it'd be cost to consult because that's like your business doing R&D for other people. So you may be able to capitalize it as an inventory cost. And then uh, startup costs, you know, one time uh, re reopening, these are expensive and period incurred. So many people have approached me like, you know, I just wanna, these are all startup costs, it take us time to, to get this going. Shouldn't I be able to capitalize those? I said, no, the rules are really clear uh, for startup costs, they are expensed uh, in the period incurred. And sometimes uh, one of the biggest startup costs is when you're starting a new entity. Um, and so the organization called the legal fees and the filing fees, all of that, uh, companies are required to expense all the cost related to startup and all the organization active in the period that you incur those expenses. You're not allowed to capitalize them, even though do, they seem like they would have a long, longer term benefit, but just according to the rules, all of these kind of startup costs must be expensed when you incur it. And we're moving to the end of the chapter. And you know, I'm sure for a lot of intermediate students, if you're not in Texas, they say, hey, don't worry about this, you know, unless you ever go to Texas and go study it. But you know, we are in Texas. I'm in Texas. And so UNT is in Texas, University of North Texas, right? And so there are two methods of accounting for oil and gas. And there's the successful efforts method and uh, the full cost. So in the full cost, all of the costs are capitalized. In successful efforts, you only capitalize successful. There's a really good example here. This company, Shannon Oil Company, incurred two million, and it drilled uh, ten oil wells, and eight of them were dry holes, <laughs> no oil. I assume that's what that means. I'm not an oil and gas person. So, so what do we do now? The full cost method. Go to that first. I just take. And I just debit uh, my cost, you know, one way I, I could see some validity to the full cost method because, hey, I wouldn't have found those two good holes if I hadn't spent, you know, uh, the, the entire uh, 20 million. And it was 10 oil wells times 2 million each. So it was, it was really 20 million, not 2 million. Well, it cost me 20 million to get two. I had eight failures. So I'm gonna debit the entire 20 million as my cost for these two good oil wells. That's called the full cost method. The other method is called the successful efforts method. Well, I'm just gonna expense those bad ones. They're gone, man, 16 million. And it really is gone in one reality. So I can see some validity to this method. And these two good wells, well, they, they really did just call me, cost me 2 million each. And so this is called the successful effort methods. You know, I don't know what companies are using mostly. You know, I'm sure operational managers, again, they like to capitalize everything. They'd probably like to do that. But then you have ongoing uh, depreciation expense at 20 million versus 4 million. So 
you know, I, again, not an expert in this area. And so, but I do want to at least put it out there, uh, especially for my students. So there you go, long-term assets, uh, assets that are used uh, beyond the year. And so we have to think about, uh, and why do we care about which costs get capitalized or not? Because those costs that get capitalized get expensed over time, over the useful life of those assets. And costs that are not capitalized get expensed now. And so that's, that's this chapter is more about which costs get capitalized. As we go into the next lecture, it's really the last lecture for Intermediate Accounting 1 at UNT, we're going to talk about, you know, after purchase, what are the, how do we record depreciation expense and other things? So that'll be the next chapter. Uh, I will uh, work uh, six or seven problems on this chapter in the next lecture that, that follows us when I usually call those lectures. Uh, I call this uh, long-term asset lecture, and the next lecture will be called long-term asset problems. And so you'll see that on YouTube. So thank you very much, and I hope you guys have a, a great day.